But anyway, I completed that, and then it would move to Seymour, Indiana, for advanced training. That's the last phase of, of pilot training, the advanced training. The point was, in my terrible condition, with all my scars and everything, would I pick it already? But wow, it was really great. Now, the other interesting thing was this. As I grew up, I went to St. John's Lutheran School here in LaGrange, and uh, St. John's Lutheran Church was very important to me. And so I got to Seymour, Indiana, and wow, I'm away from the airport, I'm from the uh, train to the airport. I went past a great big Lutheran church and Lutheran school, and wow, I could hardly wait. Sunday I went to the church there, and after the service, a young lady came up and said, you know, blah, 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 talking to me about all kinds of stuff. And she finally says, Norman, how old are you? And I told her, oh my goodness, you're too young for me, but I'd like to have you meet my sister. And she called over and her to Ella May. Now, she's with me today because we have been married for 64 years. But the point was, it's all part of my pilot training, see? I, I didn't get married right away, but uh, I say, after the service, you know, the service was over, and they said, we only live a block away. I said, I'll walk home with you. And Ella May said, no. My mother said, don't bring guys home anymore. So I said, well, I won't go in with you. I'll just walk home, and then I go back to the airbase. So the two, the two girls said, okay. So as, as we walked home, her, her, her father was sitting on the front porch on the swing, and he goes, bring him in. I told your mother that you're bringing another guy. So what well, goodness gracious, bring him in. So, all right, so I went in, and they were very impressed with me because I had been a Lutheran, and I had gone to a Lutheran school, and, and wow, that's how we met and all that kind of stuff. So uh, what it was for, for eight Sundays, I'd go to, I'd go to church there, and then I'd go to their house for dinner. It's all part of the pilot training. You see, that, that's how my, my, my life continued on. So anyway, that was very interesting. And uh, then I, I continued on from there, and I went to a, a, a B-17 pilot training. After I commissioned from school, I went to B-17s, and I immediately qualified as a pilot on a four-engine bomber pilot with a 10-man crew. Completed all that and went out to Colorado to a big crew arranger place. I got a crew assigned and went to Florida and, and flew down there for six weeks, training with the crew. I knew how to fly the airplane. We get and then based on that, we were, we were sent to England where we were located in a 95th bomb group facility. And then from there, the next thing was to bomb Europe. So as, as a B-17 pilot, that was, my, that was my job. I had a real great crew. I mean, it was this fantastic group of guys. There were four officers, a pilot, co-pilot, a, a navigator and bomber there, and six enlisted men. They were all gunners and things like that. Anyway, so we, we flew our missions, and on the fifth mission that we were on, they said I should fly group lead, which was probably was a really an, an advancement to be the fifth mission to fly that. So we, we flew from England into Germany and uh, went over a, a base there, we were dropping bombs, and fighter planes came in, and I was flying group lead as they hit me and knocked out two engines and a lot of damage in the airplane. And wow, boy, hey, uh, uh, it, I didn't want to land, I didn't want to crash land, but the, the, the group flew away from me because I was in this terrible shape. And my co-pilot and I would talk to our navigator, you know, how are we going to get back to you? So they started directing us, and so that's what we started doing flying with this engine, the airplane with two engines shot out, and, and other damage in the airplane, and wow, and so we, we hit it along about a little over an hour later, suddenly another fighter plane came in all by himself. And, wow. And I got other crewmen up there with guns, but this fighter plane just really hit us. He didn't get hit from one of our shots at all. So he hit us and, and we had more damage. And go by the high, we decided, well, we better crash land someplace. A little tiny town over there with crash land near it. And this fighter plane hit us, kept following and flying around us. So we, we, we crashed. And the plane kept circling us as so people came in from the town to take us prisoner. Old men with guns and little tiny boys with sticks. That's what was in there. 
And, and they took us prisoner, went into town, put us in a little tiny building, and closed it up. And about an hour and a half later, he made a the door open. And, Who is he? Pilos. Who? A, a German fighter pilot. And who is he? Pilos. And I said, I am. He goes, I am the pilot that shot you down. I get credit for four, for four kills because I shot down a four-engine airplane. Goodness gracious, I said, we had two engines shot out at our first target uh, a couple hours ago, and uh, he goes, shh, he said, don't, don't talk like that. He says, now another thing is, I want your leather jacket. I said, goodness gracious, it's going to be cold this winter. I, I need the leather jacket. Give me your leather jacket. He said, I didn't kill you, give me your leather jacket. So I gave him my leather jacket. And, and then we were turned over to other servicemen that were near the area. We were all taken prisoners. And based on that, we ended up in a big prison camp. Stalag Lutz Three in Saigon, Germany. Something like 12,000 Air Force officers and enlisted men. We divided in two sections, separate sections. The officers in one section, enlisted men in another section. But anyway, we, we, the section that we were, we were put in barracks, and there were rooms in these barracks, and it would be a pretty big thing. There were 14 men in each room. And, and then in each room, you, uh, you, you, you took care of all your own stuff. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're cooking and things like that. We got some stuff in from the Germans and stuff that we get packages from home and things like that. And we took turns cooking. And after the third time I cooked, the following morning, the guy said, 13 of us got together yesterday, and we asked you if you would cook full time. I said, my service background, growing up with my mother in the kitchen, see? And so, okay. And so, uh, cook full time, why? We really like what you're doing, see? And, and each day we'll give you two fellas to work with you. And that sounded great, so that's, uh, I'll, I'll take over, I'll, t I'll do it. So, okay, we, I started cooking. And uh, you get these two guys, and one of the things that the Germans provided us with were little loaves of white bread, not too big at all, but the, the bottom of the loaf of bread was just packed with a, a little grain, real coarse grain. They made it that way, I found out, because that way they roasted the bread, it didn't stick to the thing that they were roasting it on. So was, every day we'd cut that bottom crust off and throw it out to the birds. Now one day I said to the two guys that were working with me, cut that bottom crust off, they cut it in little tiny squares, and we'll put it on that tin pan over there, and an hour or two hours later, we'll take it off and put it in a box or a bag or something. And so, okay, we'll do that. So that, we did that every day. And then on the sixth day, I said to the guys, now you guys all been helping me each week with these bread crusts. Now we're gonna do Tomorrow morning, we're going to eat what you've been doing for breakfast. And they go, eh. I say, hey, it's going to be like grape nuts. You're going to take these little tiny pieces of bread crust that are really dried out, divide it into 14 bowls, mix our powdered milk with water, and go sugar and milk on this here. We're going to eat it for breakfast. They go, oh, God. I said, okay, we're going to try it anyway. Now, see, in the meantime, as a cook, I had already tried it, and I thought it was, it was pretty good. So the following morning, that's what we did. He got, he, he, oh boy, oh, oh wow, oh great, wow. Hey, hey we can, have, can we have this every week? I said, you sure can. So for a couple of weeks, that's what we did. And then I said, well, there's another thing we can do. Ask your friends in other rooms if you can have their bread crust instead of them throwing it out to the birds. So we started collecting bread crust from other rooms. We started having this breakfast cereal now, three days a week. And I said, now here's another thing. We have to tell the other guys what we're doing with these bread crusts. And, uh, and so, you know, let them also do use it. Now the thing was this, see, I, I'd gone to art school, I studied art. So I did this in prison camp, this, this side. We, first thing we had to name the, the, the cereal, it was, it's going to be like great nuts. You have to name it something. Now we were crazy of finding that. Four prisoners. And they called us Creedings. Now what is this? Eat it like great nuts? Creaky crunchies. Wow, 